Uh, my name is Venkat Guruswamy. I'm a senior scientist uh, here at the Science Institute and also serving as uh, its interim acting director this semester. And uh, it gives me great uh, pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the Simons Institute and uh, this week's uh, workshop. As you know, the Simons Institute is the leading uh, international venue for collaborative research in theory of computing and uh, related fields. It was established in 2012 uh, with a very generous grant from the Simons Foundation, which continues to support us um, very generously. The Institute brings together uh, the world's leading researchers in theory of computing, as well as uh, connected fields, and as well as the next generation of outstanding young scholars and for focused collaborative uh, research on thematic programs. So we are now in the 10th year, uh, in the second decade of programming. And each semester, we have two programs that attract several long-term visitors, junior and senior to Berkeley, and which also include multiple workshops that convene more short-term visitors. And uh, today, I would like to welcome you to the third workshop um, on optimization and algorithm design as part of the program on data structures and optimization for fast algorithms. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers of this workshop for their work in putting together a great program. So they are Alina Ine. Uh, Rasmus King and uh, uh, Yuri Nesutrov, um, Subrit Shra, and Rachel Ward. So let's give a round of applause to all of them. <laughs> and uh, just a few logistics for the coming week before I hand it over to Rasmus for introducing the workshop. So we have food before the first talk and during the breaks just outside where you were before. For lunch, you're on your own, but there are many excellent options uh, close by. And we ask that you please uh, leave uh, any food and drinks uh, outside the auditorium. It really helps us keep the auditorium clean as you see it. And if you need to store your things during lunch or other times, there are lockers on the other side of the building. You can use those. And we have our videographer, Omi Atfar, who will be uh, around throughout to help with any um, AV and other issues. And uh, one thing is that if any of you are active on um, social media like X or uh, Twitter, um, in, you know, if you're live tweeting from the workshop, uh, if you do that, please tag us at, at Simons Institute and we'll be sure to retweet your post. It kind of increases the publicity of your workshop if you're doing that. And finally, I would like to give a special uh, thanks to our event staff, uh, Ashley, Frida, and Lira for managing all the logistics uh, for this week's event. It takes a lot of effort to put together uh, an intense workshop like this and, uh, you know, um, thanks. And they will also be on uh, hand all week to answer any logistical questions. So with that, I'll hand it over uh, to Rasmus to introduce the workshop. Thanks and welcome and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first, let's start by giving an extra hand of applause to Alina because she's really the mastermind behind this workshop. Uh, and then, uh, so like, I'll only say two words about what we were trying to do, but I think we were trying to think about the ways that optimization comes about both as continuous and combinatorial stuff in some different fields. People have very different perspectives coming in this workshop, I think, and we're hoping that it would be productive to bring you all together. Also, I... Alina told me that we have set a new record for registration. So people are excited to hear your talks for those of you who are, who are speaking. So that's nice. Um, during the talks, we'll try to get microphones out to people that are asking questions so that they can be heard by people who are listening online. But on top of that, uh, if you're a speaker, try to, if you hear a question, maybe repeat the question for people listening online. Um, <clears throat> on top of that, so uh, today at 3.30, we have a, a lightning talk session where a few people will give some sort of five-minute talks uh, just to get you, you a chance to meet some of the attendees that uh, are not giving a longer talk. We still have one slot left if anybody wants to give a five-minute talk uh, spontaneously uh, between 3.30 and 4, you can tell me. Those of you who have already signed up, uh, I'll send you an email, but it would be good if you have slides, if you can send them to me, then I'll try to collect them all on uh, my laptop so we don't spend time switching. Uh, there's another important point, uh, which is that Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we have this slightly mysterious time slot called open discussions or, or something like that from 4.15 to 5.00. And uh, for these, we've asked some of the more senior attendees to, uh, so it's a 45-minute slot. Each day we have, or most days, two attendees speaking for something like 20 minutes on what they think of as promising directions in this field. So I'm hoping that for 
junior people, this could be a good way to think about where should your research be headed in the next few years, get some inspiration. And we also should have plenty of time to, to talk about things in these sessions. However, tomorrow, uh, so, okay, so Thursday, we're going to hear from uh, Omri Weinstein and David Woodruff. Wednesday, we're going to hear from Suvrit uh, and uh, Yin Yuyi. Uh, and tomorrow, we're going to hear from Rachel Ward, but we could still use more input tomorrow. So if you want to do a shorter, uh, spontaneously little talk about what you think as of as exciting open directions, uh, tell me and we'll try to squeeze you in as well tomorrow between 4.15 and 5. And importantly, I should say, we tried to frame this a little bit differently than the usual open problem sessions in theoretical computer science. We were looking for people to say something a bit broader than here's a particular technical point that I've been working on, okay? So I'm hoping these sessions will, will take like a more broad perspective and, and be exciting for, for all of us. So again, tomorrow we still have a little bit more room for people to show up and, and talk there. So tell me if, if you're interested. Okay, I think that's uh, all, the, all the stuff I had to say. So let's... Uh, Welcome to our first speaker, Melanie Weber from Harvard. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so many thanks to the organizers for um, the opportunity to speak. Um, and my talk today will be on exploiting geometric structure in matrix value optimization. Um, and that is in the context of Riemannian optimization or optimization on manifolds. Oh, and I should say important, this is all joint work with Sophie Tra, uh, one of your organizers. Yeah, so this talk is in the context of uh, Riemannian optimization, optimization on manifolds. Uh, so I want to start with just one slide of introduction um, about this class of problems and where we might encounter them in the machine learning or data science context. So in Riemannian optimization, we are trying to solve problems of the form as written here on the slide. So we have a function that's defined uh, on a Riemannian manifold, and we want to find uh, its, its minimum. We usually make some assumptions on the underlying manifold that it's smooth and connected, but other than that, it can have any um, geometric structure. Um, and problems of that form um, we encounter frequently in machine learning and data science. Three, three um, examples are shown here on the slide. So one is sampling, and there's recently been a lot of interest in um, analyzing sampling problems as optimization in uh, the space of measures, so Wasserstein space, which has a geometric structure that's similar to a uh, Riemannian manifold. Um, and then um, tools from uh, convergence analysis uh, in optimization can be used to understand uh, or derive theoretical guarantees for sampling algorithms. You might also sometimes want to train machine learning models on geometric domains, um, so on data that has a geometric structure that field is called geometric machine learning, and the, the, tra the optimization of the training loss um, could be viewed as a, as a Riemannian optimization problem. And then um, a, th a third class of such problems, and that is the examples that we will see in this talk, um, are uh, problems that involve matrix valued functions, um, and where those matrices have a geometric structure that we can parameterize as a Riemannian manifold. And there are many classical algorithms or subroutines in classical algorithms that we can view as such optimization problems. And due to this like quite broad um, set of applications of such problems, there's been a lot of interest in developing algorithms um, for these problems. Um, many of those arise from generalizations of classical algorithms to the Riemannian setting. So classical algorithms like gradient descent, uh, Frank Wolf, um, also second order optimization methods and, and many other classes um, have by now been extended to the Riemannian setting. So to give some more examples on this uh, third class of problems that I mentioned, so where um, we have metrics valued uh, optimization routines or subroutines um, that occur in uh, machine learning. Here uh, on the slide are um, a few such examples, uh, many of which I'm sure you've uh, encountered uh, in your work before. All of those can be written as optimization problems on matrices and specifically on matrix manifolds. Um, I've written here those um, underlying manifolds. You see a lot here uh, PD, 
that's the manifold of positive definite matrices, and many of the examples that we will see in the talk um, will be of that form. So if we, if we take a, a step back and think about how we might um, solve such optimization problems, there is always the option to use uh, Euclidean methods, right? We could use classical tools from Euclidean optimization matrices or, or vector spaces. So we could use Euclidean optimization methods. Um, and then the specific structure of the uh, matrices that we're working with uh, would enter as a constraint. So if we're optimizing over positive definite matrices, we would put a positive definiteness constraint if we are, let's say, in the example here of k-means clustering, um, we have an orthogonality, we, we are working with orthogonal matrices, then we would put an orthogonality constraint um, and, and so forth. And now the idea with Riemannian optimization is to uh, take the perspective that these classes of matrices correspond to a Riemannian manifold. So in the case of positive definite matrices, that's the manifold of uh, positive definite matrices. In the case of the orthogonal, or orthogonality constraint, that's, for instance, the, the Stiefel manifold. And then this parameterization already implicitly encodes the geometric structure of that class of matrices, and we don't have to impose that as an additional constraint. Right? So in, in that case, in the Riemannian setting, we can solve these problems as an unconstrained optimization problem, and that's oftentimes easier to do than a constrained problem. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the key motivations um, for why people have originally started to look into uh, Riemannian optimization. A second point, and that's one that we will exploit um, throughout this talk, is geodesic convexity. Um, it turns out that um, it, it, there are functions that are through the Euclidean lens non-convex and therefore um, challenging in an optimization context, but that fulfill a notion of geodesic convexity with respect to a Riemannian metric. So basically, if we parameterize such problems uh, in the Riemannian setting, then we can solve um, a convex problem, and, and obviously that's that's highly beneficial in the, optimi in the optimization setting. In this talk specifically, we will assume uh, that the problems have an additional structure, uh, namely that they can be written as a difference of convex functions, and we will properly introduce that class of problems uh, shortly um, and see what, what that means, but several of the example problems here on the slide uh, do fall into that category. Before we move to that, let me just uh, define this notion of geodesic convexity that we already mentioned. So this is basically just a generalization of the usual concept of convexity to the Riemannian setting. So this condition that you see here on the slide uh, should look very familiar, right? That's the usual convexity condition just now evaluated along a geodesic gamma. So we call that a, a geodesic is the shortest path between two points on uh, the manifold and the specific shape of that geodesic depends on the geometry of the, of the manifold. So in the case of positive definite matrices, for instance, the example that we will see in the talk that has a specific uh, form that we know and that we can um, directly implement uh, in practice. This generalized notion of convexity has, in the optimization context, the same nice properties that, that we, we usually have with convexity. So it guarantees that there's a unique uh, global optimum meaning that if our algorithm finds a local optimum, we can be sure that that is the global optimum. And that's, of course, highly desirable because that means that we can derive global convergence guarantees for our algorithm. Okay, so the, the class of problems that we're interested in is as follows. So again, our objective function is defined on the Riemannian manifold, but now we additionally assume that it can be written as a difference of two Euclidean convex functions. And now the difference of two convex functions is, of course, in general, non-convex. And that makes the problem challenging uh, to solve. In this talk, we will look at a subclass of those problems where the overall objective is, in addition, geodesically convex. So it might be Euclidean non-convex, but it is geodesically convex. And in fact, some of our simple problems that we saw earlier and that are listed again here on the slide fall exactly um, into that subclass of problems and we will see other examples uh, later on in the talk. Difference of convex optimization is not uh, a new topic. There's been a lot of work um, on solving problems of that form, either with Euclidean or Riemannian methods. Um, in, in the Euclidean setting, of course, that's a, a non-convex optimization setting, so quite challenging to do, but nevertheless, there are good algorithmic approaches for solving such problems. Um, there's also some work on, um, of course, solving geodesically convex um, optimization um, and also difference of convex optimization in the Riemannian setting. 
But what has not done before is to kind of merge the two approaches. So to look at Euclidean algorithms, but to see whether that additional structure, that geodesic convexity, can be used to understand the convergence properties of the algorithm better. And that's exactly the perspective that we want to take here. So the, the algorithms that we're um, analyzing in this talk are um, CCCP algorithms. That stands for Convex Concave Procedure. And it's a very simple Euclidean algorithm that I can um, derive for you in, in one slide. So, so I will do that. Um, so uh, we know that our objective function can be written as a difference of two Euclidean convex functions. Mm -hmm. So in particular, due to the Euclidean convexity of H, we have this inequality that's written here in point one. That's just the usual convexity with the terms uh, be arranged. And then we can take that inequality and insert it into the objective function. And that gives us a convex upper bound of the objective function that we see here um, in, in point two, and we denote as Q. And then the idea of the CCCP algorithm is to, instead of directly minimizing the objective function, that we successively minimize that upper bound. Okay, so that's really here in point three. And in order to do this, we have to solve um, this subproblem on the right hand side, the so called CCP oracle. So basically, we're minimizing this um, upper bound, the surrogate Q. And then successively minimizing and solving that subproblem um, will give us a monotonically decreasing sequence that uh, converges to the, uh, the optimal value of the original underlying. So at, at no point in this algorithm have we used Riemannian tools, right? That's a purely Euclidean algorithm. We don't have to compute Riemannian gradients. We don't have to compute uh, exponential maps or parallel transport operators. So all the um, computa sometimes computationally expensive tools that we have to compute um, in Riemannian optimization, uh, we avoid computing here. It's a purely Euclidean algorithm, so there's no additional overhead from I'm not confused, but, but you're still minimizing this uh, upper bound. Yes. So, but you're. Is this... no, it's... <laughs> but you're you're still computing x k plus one by minimizing over the manifold, yes. right? So that may involve optimization. Oh, how to solve that that sub problem? We'll, we'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So. Yeah, that's a, a good point. So, of course, in order to efficiently implement that, we need to find a good way of solving the CCP oracle, right? And, and we, we will get to that. But so, so for now, this is a, a Euclidean algorithm, right? We, we might have to think about how to solve the CCP procedure, but up until here, we haven't computed any Riemannian tools. So it's a Euclidean algorithm. And we also, and that's been known before, so as I said, those algorithms have been um, considered in the in the previous literature and it's known um, that they do converge to a local optimum of the um, of the underlying original objective um, this is only to to a local optimum right due to non-convexity um, and those results tend to be um, asymptotic convergence guarantees so now um, in the, in the analysis that we are proposing here, so this is for the, for the general class of problems that are not necessarily geodesically convex. But if we're working, if we're looking at the subclass of problems that is geodesically convex, um, then we can give um, a sharper convergence analysis. Um, in particular, under some mild regularity assumptions, we can show that um, in the geodesically convex setting, this algorithm converges to the, the global optimum, right? We, we now have a, a, a unique global optimum because we, we are in the geodesically convex setting. And in fact, we can also use um, the geodesic convexity in the analysis to derive uh, sublinear convergence guarantees. Um, in particular, we get um, sublinear rates, so on the order of one over K, where the constants depend on the, the geometry of the manifold. I'm not gonna go through the proof here, but it's similar to um, that of the, the MISO algorithm, um, if, if you're familiar with that algorithm. So now the, the crucial part is, um, so aside from that, that is just an iteration complexity, right? It doesn't say anything about the complexity of computing one of those iterations, and it assumes that we have found um, a good solution to um, the CCP oracle in each 
um, iteration. Now let's look at what is actually involved with um, solving that CCC code goal. And it turns out that actually for many problems in this um, matrix uh, optimization setting, we can solve that uh, CCCP oracle in closed form. So there's no actual optimization routine involved in solving the subproblem. We have an analytic solution um, to the CCCP oracle, and that renders the overall algorithm into a simple fixed point iteration. And here are some examples um, where that is the case. Um, many of those were known um, beforehand, but with the previous convergence analysis, we could only get asymptotic convergence guarantees, right? But with the now um, using the fact that those objective functions are geodesically convex, we can get uh, global non-asymptotic convergence guarantees in our framework. I wonder if you could give some intuition for um, at least one, ex could you give some intuition for at least one example about why it can be a difference of convex functions in Euclidean space, but geodesically convex? So we will see some, some concrete Wonderful. examples and also how to fix point iterations. Wonderful. If that doesn't answer your question, Great. we can go, go back to it. Um, just, just one more note before we, we get to actual examples. Um, so of course there might be settings where we cannot solve the CCCP oracle in closed form, right? And then um, solving the subproblem, the, the only thing we can do is to call a numerical solver and um, solve the subproblem approximately. So we won't have an exact solution and that will introduce an approximation error. Um, in that setting, we, we can show that we can still um, get um, sublinear um, rates as long as we get a sufficiently good um, uh, <coughs> approximate solution to the subproblem. And then that only um, that makes our constants slightly, slightly worse, our convergence rates, um, but we can still uh, show um, a sublinear rate. Um, but the, the interesting cases are really the settings where we have a closed form solution and um, where the CCCP algorithm uh, becomes a simple fixed point iteration. So now let me show you some examples of this. Um, the first one is um, the problem of uh, computing square roots of positive definite matrices. And um, that can be written as a problem on the manifold of positive definite matrices as follows. This is here written um, with respect to the S divergence. Uh, so this is a setting where the CCCP oracle can be solved in closed form and this uh, using that closed form gives this simple uh, fixed point iteration. So that would be um, one example and the objective here has a difference of convex um, uh, structure. For that um, fixed point iteration that was known before, it's actually derived uh, by Sophie Tra in, in a paper. Um, in, in that paper, there were only asymptotic convergence guarantees given, but now with our framework, we can actually show that it has a sublinear iteration complexity and that is also corroborated, or we see this also illustrated in the numerical examples. The CCCP approach here is shown um, in the red curve. And then the other curves uh, in the plot are first order Riemannian optimization methods. We see here that the CCCP method um, outperforms them for all um, the sample inputs here. Um, but overall, it's like um, they, they clearly all lie in the same uh, like complexity class. Um, and then first order methods have a sublinear iteration complexity. So this uh, aligns with, with what we see um, in, in our theory. Um, this, the second example that I, I want to mention and focus on for the rest of the talk is the computation of press complete constants. That's a problem that arises in the, con in the context of press complete inequalities. That's a class of inequalities um, in functional analysis that has uh, many applications and connections in various areas of mathematics, computer science, and statistics. Um, many of you probably have encountered before examples of press complete inequalities, such as Felder's inequality, for instance. Um, of theoretical, um, this, this problem is also of theoretical importance due to connections to the operator scaling problem, which is a very um, important uh, problem in theoretical computer science and has many connections to other important problems, such as maximum likelihood estimation, for instance, or metric scaling. Um, all of those are special instances of the operator scaling problems problem, and, and so is the, the computation of press complete constants. So on the slide here written is the, the general form of the press complete inequality. Um, that's determined by a set of linear transformations, script A and uh, exponents W. And then um, so those two, the linear transformations and the exponents are known as the press complete uh, datum that determines the particular press complete inequality. 
And then we want to decide whether there exists a finite constant C such that that inequality is true. So basically, if there's a if this is a non-trivial inequality, um, and if so, then we call the press complete datum feasible. And in that case, we want to know what the exact value of that constant C is, which characterizes um, the overall inequality. And and F are uh, we evaluate non-negative functions. So the, this this problem of understanding whether the press complete datum is uh, feasible and what the the constant might be can be written as an optimization task on the manifold of positive definite matrices that's written out here. So basically, we want to compute an absolute approximate solution to that uh, constant. That problem um, has received a lot of interest over the years. So originally, it was proposed in the, in the mid 70s in um, several papers by Braskamp and Lieb. Um, so they defined this problem class and also already showed that if we view this as an optimization problem, the optimizer is attained over positive definite matrices. So we can phrase it as a problem um, over the positive definite matrices. And then about 20 years later, um, an algorithm for this problem was given by Gorbitz or for the more general operator scaling problem, but then also giving a solution to um, the, the problem of computing press complete constants. That's a purely Euclidean algorithm. And in his original paper, he gives uh, asymptotic convergence guarantees. So he shows that the algorithm converges, but not how, fa how fast, so no um, non-asymptotic convergence analysis. That was then given in a series of paper, papers by uh, many of the main authors of those papers are Victorson, Oliviera, Garg, and Alan Sue. Um, and they actually applied a Riemannian perspective to this problem. So they noticed that this, objective, this underlying objective function of computing press complete constants is geodesically convex and use tools from Riemannian optimization to derive, to, to give a non asymptotic convergence analysis um, of Gorbitz algorithm. Um, the results that you get from that analysis and then from some improved analysis that came out more recently um, is that the iteration complexity is linear, so log on the order of log one over epsilon. Um, it's conjectured that it's overall a linear convergence, so that um, and, sorry, overall um, an efficient algorithm. Um, the current best um, results still have an exponential dependency on the press complete datum on the uh, the bit complexity, the size of the press complete datum. So this is not um, this is still an, an open problem. Linear convergence with polynomial um, bit length is still um, open in the general case. We're also not solving that here, but what we want to do is uh, to, to give a new geometric perspective on this problem um, using some of the tools um, and the CCP analysis um, that, we, that we talked about earlier in the talk. Um, in order to do this, um, we analyze a slightly different formulation of the problem than um, what was used to derive Gorbitz algorithm but one that nevertheless goes, goes right back to the original work by Praskam and Lieb. Namely, we um, look at this optimization problem, um, again defined on the manifold of positive definite matrices, um, that has um, a difference of convex structure, and it is geodesically convex. So basically, it fits into our um, uh, subclass of, of problems uh, for our CCCP framework. And importantly, the CCCP oracle in that case can be solved in closed form. And that gives the simple um, iterative map that you see here um, on the slide. Um, if we um, implement this, this method and try it out on some sample inputs, we, we get the following results. So the colors are as before. In red, we see the CCCP algorithm. And then the other um, curves in the, the plot are uh, Riemannian first order methods, so variants of Riemannian gradient descent. And we see here, again, CCCP beats the Riemannian methods, but this time actually quite substantially. Right? In particular, as the size of the input increases, so as we look at the, the plots on the right-hand side, we see that it very substantially um, improves over the first order methods. And based on that, that kind of gives us a hint that the sublinear convergence rate that we get from the previous CCCP analysis um, is actually conservative, right? So that just gives us an upper bound. And looking at these plots, um, it looks like that that might be uh, too conservative. And the convergence of that fixed point iteration is actually much faster than something. In order to 
um, analyze that um, with uh, some, some more detail. Um, we put a different geometric lens on the problem. So in the previous discussion, um, we have said that positive definite matrices could be viewed as a Euclidean space, could be viewed as a Riemannian space with the, the usual um, Riemannian metric that we put on positive definite matrices that arises from the uh, Frobenius product. But we can also, for instance, put um, a, a different metric um, like this one, the Thomson part metric on the positive definite matrices. Uh, that gives us a non-Riemannian geometry, a thin slot geometry on the positive definite matrices. Um, and that turns out to be a, a critical um, ingredient in, in our analysis. Um, a second key ingredient is regularization. So we are not solving um, directly the objective function that you saw earlier, but we put a regularizer to that and then we derive the fixed point iteration. And this is the map um, that we get. And those two ingredients are, are crucial to um, give uh, linear convergence analysis. Um, namely, uh, we can show that this regularized iterative map contracts strictly under the Thompson metric. This is something that we could not show with the, the previous method that was not regularized, and we were also not able to show this in the Riemannian setting, but with the regularized map and the uh, uh, Finsler geometry, the, the, the setting that um, endows the positive definite matrices with the Thomson metric, we were able to show a strict uh, contraction. And then um, we can analyze the, the rate of the contraction. Um, and we can in fact show that the regularized map um, converges um, or give, gives an epsilon approximation to the press complete constant with an iteration complexity that is uh, linear, so on the order of log one over epsilon. And the, the, in this, this formulation, there's a polynomial dependence on the um, uh, press complete datum, on the, on the bit complexity of the press complete datum. But unfortunately, there's one caveat, so this does not solve uh, the general conjecture because this is only subject to suitable initialization. Um, so we, we know from um, a paper by Bennett, Carberry, Christ, Christ and uh, Tao that um, the press complete constant, um, that there's an, an, an upper and lower bound for um, the optimum at which the, the press complete constant is uh, attained. Um, and uh, those upper and lower bounds depend on two constants, uh, little data and capital data. And while we know that those constants exist, um, we are currently don't know how to efficiently compute those constants. So this is a not, construct, not a constructive proof. Um, and we also don't know if it can be done efficiently. So that is the, the, open, um, uh, the, the, the open problem in the setting. We have um, a regularized map that at least um, empirically um, does seem to converge at a linear rate. And it has a polynomial um, bit, bit complexity in the press complete um, in, in the, uh, the, the size of the press complete datum, um, but it is only subject to a good initialization. And in order to um, completely solve the problem, we would need to be able to efficiently compute um, a suitable initialization, uh, which is currently open. And that brings me to the end of my talk. So there are uh, two. Um, works that, that I, I talked about in this talk. The first one um, was a, a, a framework for CCCP algorithms for difference of convex um, optimization where the objective function is geodesically convex. Um, in this setting, we provide uh, global non-asymptotic convergence guarantees. For some instances of that problem class, um, the, the first uh, global non-asymptotic convergence guarantees. Um, in particular, in settings where this, this crucial subroutine in the CCP oracle can be solved um, efficiently, this gives a, a very practical algorithm, um, as you've previously seen in the, uh, in the numerical experiments. And then in the second part of the talk, we um, looked, have had a closer look at one specific instance of that problem class, namely the problem of computing press complete constants. Um, this is one of the instances where, in fact, um, we have a closed form solution to um, the CCP oracle, so a very um, efficient fixed point iteration. And then for that too, we can um, establish fast non-asymptotic convergence guarantees subject to a, a good initialization, which is the, the key open problem here. And then in the future, of course, um, it would be great to, to solve this, this problem and um, find an efficient way to um, 
compute an efficient initialization for this um, algorithm for the plus complete constants. But more generally, I think um, this, this structure, um, this, this problem class that, that we are um, considering here for the CCCP framework um, is, can be found in many um, machine learning applications. And I think there's um, lots of um, potential for applying such, uh, such Riemannian tools um, to uh, various problems in machine learning that involve metrics value optimization. Any further questions? A very simple question, I imagine. Um, you assume that the function is uh, geodesically convex, the, the big one. Yes. But then in your sub problem, you're solving, uh, you, your sub problem has the concave part of the objective that is linearized. Yes. Is, that, is that the problem, or like given that the original function is, you know, can that be a problem ever? The fact that you're assuming that. The original function is, is uh, convex in the Riemannian geometry, and then you're not actually minimizing that function in this problem. So the, I'm not not sure I, I completely understand. So the solving the the sub problem itself, depending on what specific problem we are looking at, that is that is certainly a key step that has to be worked out, right? We're arguing here there are a lot of instances of this problem where we can solve that in closed form. So there's actually no optimization routine needed for the sub problem. But you're saying that in general, if like from the geodesic convexity, if we get any special structure for the subproblem, is that the question? Yeah, or maybe even simpler, the fact that you linearize in the Euclidean space, does that make the function uh, potentially look nasty in the Riemann uh, space? So the, the 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 construction the construction of the CCP algorithm doesn't doesn't use any geometric structure, right? Well, like not in the channel, not in the channel setting. So you can view this as a sort of the right hand side as a as a black box, let's say. And then there are instances where this has a closed form solution, so we don't have to worry about an optimization routine. And then there are other settings where we can solve it in closed form. And then we have to, for specific problems, look at how can we efficiently solve this. Mm -hmm. Right. And depending on the specific structure of the problem, maybe there's some geometric structure that can help us solve the subproblem, but that will be depending on the specific instance of the problem. Yeah, so that the fact that the overall objective is geodesically convex does not immediately give sort of a, a general insight into that subproblem. It's more the, the analyzing the iteration complexity of the algorithm that is influenced by the geodesic complexity. And that's, that's where we're using it, right, to, to get this, this result. How many iterations do we need to get an epsilon approximate solution, assuming we can solve the subproblem in some way? Yeah, makes sense. Uh, when you say asymptotic convergence, you meant convergence of the function values, right? Do we have any like, results on the asymptotic convergence to the iterates? Like, because you have x star, right? It can be different x stars, right? Do we have any results on on convergence to the solution, which is not the function values? Like here, like, can you show the convergence rates? So, so when I say asymptotic, so just to, to clarify, so asymptotic convergence, that means the algorithm will converge, but I, I, I can't quantify how fast that will happen. Yeah, 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 Whereas but... in a setting like this, right, I can say after k iterations, I'm on the order of one over k close, or like the, the, optim the optimality gap is on the order of one over k. Yeah, and, and the question is like, uh, what exactly converge? Does the iterates xk converge to x star, or the values of phi of xk converge to phi of x star? So, so I, I get this this inequality. Oh, right? all right. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm that's okay. no, no. I might be misunderstanding. I, I can talk with you in like uh, okay. Okay. after the lecture. Sorry. Yeah. Any other questions for a moment? Is an accelerated work notice? Sorry. Is an accelerated work notice? Um, not that I'm aware. For CCP in general. Um, yeah, not that, not that I'm aware. I don't know. 
All right. So let's thank Melanie again. Thank you.